Hi everyone, I'm Paul Ox Johnson from Haven Ox Johnson, the friendly boat insurance providers, and welcome to this, the latest webinar in our From the Helm series. Uh, today we have covered all sorts of varied topics on our webinars, from sailing around Britain to living on a narrowboat with YouTubers Fran and Rich, from floating our boat to installing lithium batteries in your boat. You can watch all of them on our YouTube channel. With tonight's webinar, we are focusing on helping people to get the most out of their boats. If you're used to sailing around the coast of the UK, as beautiful as it is, you might be ready to push yourself and have a whole new adventure. And this is just where this webinar comes in. We want to give you the confidence to cross the channel and cruise North France. And hopefully this webinar will give you that confidence. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Bob Garrett. Bob is one of the current channel secretaries at the Cruising Association. So it's safe to say he has a wealth of knowledge on this topic. So over to you, Bob. Thank you, Paul, and good evening, everyone. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, my wife and I have sailed a Do 4365, which is a 36-foot yacht uh, from Chichester for about 12 years. Uh, before that, we had a Maxi 1000, which we also sailed from Chichester, often across the Channel. On our current boat, we've sailed some 22,000 miles so far and have cruised not just the English Channel, but also to Ireland, to Western France, to Northern Spain, and we also spent six months in the Baltic, going as far as St. Petersburg. We've also chartered boats in Greece, Croatia, France and the Caribbean, as well as crewing with friends in the Med and the Caribbean and up to Bermuda. My wife Sue and I are joint secretaries for the Cruising Association's channel section, which means we collate and distribute information and advice to CA members, as well as organising events such as rallies. Uh, because of rallies and other commitments, we have on a few occasions actually crossed the channel some six times. But let's get on and talk about France and what might take you there. New passage making experiences is something that we all enjoy. Uh, visiting new and different ports, friendly and cheaper marinas, uh, different and interesting scenery, be that in the coast or inland, the culture, the history and the events that you can experience there. Plus, of course, being France, the culinary experiences in restaurants and indeed what you can cook on your own boat. Maybe slightly better weather, being a little bit further south. But before we look further at where to go and why, let's just talk about some of those practicalities. Now, for many, crossing the channel would seem pretty routine. But for some, particularly if it's their first time, it can be a big step. Now, from leading a number of rallies over a number of years, it's been interesting talking to some of those crossing for the first time and hearing what their concerns are. These might be the length of the passage. It might be being out of sight of land or worries about big ships, worrying about foreign marinas and the processes or not speaking the language and even what to do on a longer passage than usual. So in this presentation, I hope to allay some of those fears by setting out what you should consider and also why crossing the channel to cruise to new places is so attractive. So let's start off by talking about when to go. Well, as I've said, the weather is fairly similar to the south coast of the UK, maybe a little bit further south, so it may be a little bit warmer. Maybe the depressions that uh, sweep across the Atlantic will be a bit further north. So it can be similar, but maybe a little bit better. The marinas themselves are open all the time. Uh, but bear in mind, French holidays are roughly from mid-July, which Bastille Day being the 14th of July, to mid-August, which is uh, 15th of August is Assumption Day. Now, at one time, France was fairly rigid in terms of when people would take holidays, but it's much more flexible now, so you don't get that sudden cutoff. So going during the summer period, that busy four weeks, you will get better weather and more events to entertain you, but it will be busier. I always think personally the best time is just before or just after that French peak period, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't go during that peak period. Now, what about cruising areas? Well, in this presentation, we are talking mainly about short breaks, so perhaps a couple of weeks. And depending on your style of cruising and the weather, this does limit the size of the area you might cruise to in such a period. So later on, I will focus on some of the main cruising areas as being the Opal Coast, um, going down to the Bay de Seine, which for a short cruise, I would then recommend splitting in two. That's the Bay de Seine in two halves. West of the Cotentin Peninsula, which includes the Channel Isles, 
and maybe a bit further away, but possibly in a short period with some longer passages than North Brittany. But we'll come back to this later. First, let's talk a bit more about the planning. Now, in terms of planning, the key is developing that passage plan, it being one of the few things that we British sailors have as a legal requirement placed on us. Though what's in that plan and how it's documented is not formally described. But let's go through some of the likely elements. So we're going to talk about the boat and its equipment, we'll talk about the routes, talk about tides, the crew, the weather, navigation, pilotage and berthing, and paperwork. So let's start off on the boat and equipment. Things to think about, first of all, are your capabilities of your boat. What, what is your experience and where you've been and what sort of situations can you uh, comfortably cruise in? Think about the checks that you should be doing on the boat, like the engine. Has it been recently serviced, reliable? Have you got the right spares and tools on board? Have you got sufficient fuel? All the typical things that you might do for a longer passage. It's not to suggest that in France there isn't the availability of engineers or anything, but you don't want to interrupt your holiday for some sort of repair that's necessary. Think about similarly the rigging, the sails, the standing rigging and the running rigging. Batteries are important for a longer passage. Maybe you'll be sailing for 12 hours, ideally without running the engine. Can the batteries keep your instruments going for that longer passage? And if not, do you plan to say, well, I'm going to run the engine for half an hour or an hour just to charge things up a bit more? Think about all the electrical things like lights. Uh, if you've got a longer passage and you arrive a little bit later than perhaps the day sail you planned, are all your navigation lights working? What about radio? navigational instruments, auto helm and so on. We'll talk about those in a bit more detail later on. Think about what safety equipment you should have on board. Radar reflector, VHF, flares, life jackets, safety lines, maybe an EPIRB or PLB, radar or maybe AIS, a life raft, first aid, man overboard equipment, torches, all these sorts of things. And we're very lucky in the UK that we are not tied down by particular requirements. But one of the questions that often comes up is, when you travel to France, what do you need to have on board? What might the French expect? In France, they're far more regulated. And the image on the right hand side on this particular screen is a leaflet that is available to French sailors setting out the equipment they should have on their boat, determined by how far offshore they're going to be sailing. Uh, and it presents a very useful table. It's something worth looking at, but it's all very sensible advice. Um, but it is not a requirement for British sailors unless you have a second address, a residence in France, in which case it is then applicable to you. But one of the particular things to be very aware of is other French regulations say that you should not have on board out of date flares, a life raft that is not within its service period, or indeed fire extinguishers within their service period. So that is something to be aware of. Today, we carry a lot more electronic aids to navigation and communication than ever before. All of them have some value, but it doesn't make them essential. But nor does it make it wise to go without. So VHF, I would say, is something that you really wouldn't want to do without. Uh, for general communications, perhaps between ships and ship to shore, maybe calling up the uh, marinas, maybe calling up the Coast Guard. But you also get the latest forecasts uh, and talking to shipping, maybe using DSC. AIS is something else that people say, well, should I have it? Well, receive is very useful because it gives you a much better idea of the names of other ships uh, and their closest point of approach, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Transmit is even better because it means those ships can actually see you more easily and understand what your course and speed is. If you do have IIS, make sure it's been installed correctly to show you, if you have a yacht, i.e. a sailing vessel, that it actually does identify you as a sailing vessel. Uh, we've come across a number of people on rallies who, even though they've had IIS installed professionally, the uh, installer has left it in the default setting, which is pleasure, which means ships will assume that you're a motor vessel, and therefore, of course, the Canadian regulations would change. On the topic of radar, well, radar is not an essential requirement, but a reflector is legally required because you can come across fog even in the summer. 
So what about routes? Well, I've divided the channel up over the next couple of slides into three areas. The things to think about is your starting point. Is it a convenient place to leave from? Are you going to get that stuck behind a lock gate or something when you want to leave? And similarly, the landfall points. Is the port that you're going to one that you can get into at the time that you're going to arrive? Is it a port of entry? Is it one that is, let's say, sheltered from winds that the prevailing winds might be causing some extra swell in the entrance? Most channel crossings are going to be day sails. So you're going to be having more sailing in the open sea, um, perhaps longer distances. So you could maybe think about the, the points that you would have as alternative points of arrival. So you know, the Eastern Channel, we've got fairly short distances. You might be starting off from Ramsgate or Dover or Eastbourne, and you might be heading across to Dunkirk or Calais or Boulogne. So we're, we're talking about distances of maybe 25 miles and a bit more. So we're probably talking about quite easily a day sail, maybe even half a day. But if we then look at the Central Channel, we've got much, much greater distances. And of course, we have a lot of British sailors based around the Solent and Paul. Uh, but equally, there's a lot of sailors down in Tour Bay, and they'll be crossing maybe to Cherbourg or Guernsey, which is a distance of about 75 miles. So again, we're probably talking about a day sail, leaving early in the morning and arriving early evening. But if we go further west, then we're talking about a much greater distance and probably a distance that can't be achieved during daylight, in which case you're probably going to think, well, I want to leave in the afternoon so that I can arrive in daylight the following day. Now, checking into the EU after Brexit means that our first port of call must be a port of entry. Just like any other country, we would have visited all over the world. In France, a port of entry is called a PPF. You don't really need to know that term in detail, but you might see it on forms and wonder what it means. The reason you have to do this is you've got to have your documents checked to ensure you're allowed entry and not overstayed, and to have your passports stamped. Now, very few ports on the north coast of France are actually designated as ports of entry. Uh, and this particular map from uh, cap the uh, CA's application, uh, Captain's Mate, lists them. So it's Dunkirk, Calais, Boulogne, Dieppe, Lave, Honfleur, Caen, which is actually Wistrom, uh, Cherbourg, Carteret, Granville, St. Marlo, St. Brieux, and Roscoff in the west. And then just around the corner, which I put on there as well, is Brest itself. These are all basically ports which have, or used to have, ferries arriving there. Quite often, though, you will find the actual office for leisure sailors to go and, and check in is going to be in the ferry terminal itself. Quite often, that means those offices are not close to marinas and may not be open all the time uh, because some will be manned just for the ferries. And in some cases, the local officials also cover a local airport. We'll talk about this a bit more later, but it does influence your choice of landfall. So what about tide? Well, we're talking about some pretty big tides. If we go down towards the uh, St. Marlow area, uh, or around Cap de la Hague, we're talking about tidal streams of up to eight knots and ranges of nearly 11 metres. So be very aware of the headlands and tidal gates. So, for example, the Needles uh, for, on the UK side and Cap de la Hague on the French side or the Little Russell around Guernsey. Be aware of the coastal stream, for example, at Cherbourg. You should always plan to arrive upstream of the destination because you don't want to spend the last hour or two just fighting the tide to do the last few miles. And remember not to expect or indeed try for a constant course over ground. You really should be describing the sort of curve that you will see on this diagram here uh, because the tide is going to take you one way at first and then for another six hours it'll take you back the other way. If you try and fight that, you're probably going to do an extra five miles and maybe take you another hour to get there. Uh, but we've talked about ideal landfalls. And of course, the other thing to bear in mind is a tidal height for many ports. With that range of nearly 11 metres, be aware that there are lots of ports in France that have limited access. So you can only get in and out a few hours either side of high water. Uh, they will often have sills or rocks or entrance channels because you can't enter until the tide has reached a certain height. 
which takes us on to overall timing for your passage. You need to make allowances for the weather, the wind strength. Maybe if there's not much wind, you're going to be motoring and therefore not going as fast. Or maybe there's a good, decent wind uh, and therefore you're going to do a good speed. The direction. If, as the example we just showed, you're going from the Solent to Cherbourg, if you're going against a southerly wind, you're going to be tacking all your way across and it's going to take you longer. An equally swell will slow down your boat, so be aware of what the swell is going to be. So make allowances for the tide, the stream and the height. Make an allowance for your boat performance in the particular conditions that you're likely to uh, find. And it is best to arrive at new ports in particular, ports you've not been to before, in light, not at night. So the next thing to consider is your crew. How many people are going to be with you on your boat? What experience and qualifications and skills and strengths may they have? Somebody might be extremely qualified, but maybe their strength is not sufficient that they can raise the sail. Maybe they're very strong, but their experience of, of steering is not that great. So you need to make those sorts of decisions as to who should be doing what and being aware that if somebody is perhaps a little bit seasick, then are they going to be useful to you or not? And on topic of seasickness, make sure that you know about the health of people that are coming on your boat and what medications they may have. And if they are somebody that's susceptible to seasickness, it, it is always much, much better to give them seasickness tablets well in advance rather than once they start to suffer. I've always found if I've got somebody who might be seasick, it's a good thing to put them on the wheel to steer. A, because it gives them something to concentrate their mind away from feeling seasick. And secondly, because it means they're looking in the distance, they're looking at the horizon, and their brain is better able to cope with the motion of the boat. And in particular for your crew, keep them fed. <laughs> Eating constantly across the channel is something we're very good at on our boat. So weather, what about the weather? Well, again, you need to consider it for yourself, for your boat, and for your crew. What is acceptable in the conditions? What are the prevailing winds uh, for different crossings and landfalls? Consider not just the steady wind and the direction. Think also about the gusts. Think about the sea state. If there was some very strong winds the day before, then there's going to be more swell and maybe people are going to feel more uncomfortable and it may also slow you down. And also consider visibility. And as I say, think about all of these things, not just from your own personal perspective, but think about it from your boat and from your crew. So what about weather? Uh, I'm not going to tell you which forecasts to use, nor I'm going to tell you how to interpret them. There are much greater experts than me, and we all have particular preferences in how the weather information is presented to us. But what I will say is do consider a variety of forecasts. There are those that are generated by computer, and there are those that are actually uh, produced by people who are using those computers. Consider both the tabular and the graphical information. So if we look at something like uh, the Coast Guard's forecast from the Met Office uh, in the UK or from Meteo France, then of course those are going to be interpreted by people. Uh, and that gives you an extra piece of information about the, uh, the what's coming. Things like XC weather, windy passage weather, uh, and all these other things, they produce the information purely from a computer model. Uh, and that means that maybe there may be some extremes in there that you're not aware of or that a, uh, a proper forecaster would actually say, no, that's not the case. What I also suggest you do is you compare forecasts. So, for example, I particularly like the Windy app because I can get an instant comparison of the GFS computer forecast and the ECM WF forecast. If they're very similar, then I think there's a greater reliability that the forecast is going to be accurate. But if they're very different, then the forecast may be a little bit unreliable, and therefore there's some more variation in there. Grid files are also invaluable, especially because you can store the forecasts and review the forecast over the first few days before you sail. Uh, GRIB stands for graphical binary, I think it is. Um, Basically, it's a, a forecast of the wind in a sort of matrix format on top of a map. Um, we can show one later on, but basically it's a way of representing the information um, graphically on a computer. 
So perhaps a, a week beforehand, I would start downloading rib files and then each day look at them, compare them with the day before's forecast for the day I plan to cross the channel. If nothing is changing from day to day for my passage day, then I know the forecast is fairly stable. If it's changing dramatically, then it suggests that perhaps there is some unknown weather coming along. So keep reviewing it right up to departure and also while you're underway. I just mentioned as well here what it says on the slide about Meteo France. They have a very good app that you can load on your phone, even without sort of particular French knowledge. It can be very easily interpreted. So think about navigation and references. Again, your personal preferences. Obviously, you need charts, but electronic or paper. Uh, I, I think you need both. I know more and more people are using electronic charts, but having paper does give you that backup and it gives you a wider view of the whole area you're sailing across. The Tidal Stream Atlas is invaluable, particularly if you're going around Cap de la Hague or through the Channel Islands. You'll need an almanac because it will contain all the port details such as marina layouts, tides, tidal access, limitations and so on. You might also visit some of the port's websites, particularly if they are ones that uh, you can only get in and out of at particular states of the tide, because their websites will often give you the detailed gate timing for each day. Uh, and then pilot books and uh, perhaps things like Captain's Mate or other apps. Captain's Mate is a CA app um, which provides you port information as well as reports, in, in this case, uh, from other cruising association members. So what about food, victualling, as we call it on boats? Um, the first time we crossed the channel, I remember my wife asking a friend, what do you do for the, let's say, 12 hours you're crossing the channel? Uh, and her answer was, well, we eat. <laughs> and that is, tends to be what we do. We have a first breakfast, we have a second breakfast, we have elevenses, we have lunch, we have afternoon tea, uh, and maybe we have dinner if we're arriving a bit late. And of course, in between, we're having snacks. <laughs> Uh, so on passage, think about what meals you might want to eat, what snacks you want to have handy for a long day and maybe across the night. Uh, have them ready prepared just in case it's a bit rough and nobody wants to go below and start cooking things. Maybe have drinks hot and cold in a vacuum flask. But also beyond what you're going to eat on the way across the channel, think about what ship straws you might want to have. Uh, we all look forward, I'm sure, to French food, but what are the things you might miss that you might have difficulty buying in France? Uh, take those with you and maybe have some staples for an emergency like pasta or part baked bread, uh, tinned meat or soups, things like that. But bear in mind, uh, because we're no longer part of the EU, you shouldn't take anything fresh, uh, particularly meats, ashore. Yeah, you're quite OK having them on the boat, but you should not take them ashore. So paperwork. We've always needed a set of paperwork to cross the channel, uh, but now we need a little bit more and it's more likely to be checked. So you will need to be checking out when you leave the UK and you'll need to be checking in when you arrive at the Channel Islands or in France. Uh, and for doing this, you need papers. Now, I'm going to go through quite a long list of papers here. You don't need them all, uh, but, let, but let's go through them anyway. So first of all, passports, obviously passports for all the people on the crew. You need your boat papers, which will consist of things like your ship's radio license, your boat registration, uh, VAT proof, RCD, which is the Recreational Craft Directive. Uh, you'll need insurance papers. Uh, it's a good idea to have evidence of competence for the skipper. Uh, maybe an ICC or another RYA certificate um, and radio certificate. There's one um, certificate that is quite often asked about, which is the CEVNI, C -E -V -N -I, um, which is something for inland waterways of France. Uh, but you do only need it for inland waterways and you don't need it either for the canal up to Caen, nor indeed for the Rance. Another bit of paperwork you should have is your logbook. Uh, you should have EHIC or GHIC, that's the European Health Insurance Card, or now the Global Health Insurance Card, issued by the UK government, uh, because you might have a medical emergency. Uh, and you should also think about other personal travel insurance. And bear in mind that EHIC and GHIC may cover you for a lot of the expenses that you might come across 
uh, for medical use in France, but it doesn't cover everything. And in particular, it doesn't cover repatriation. So if you are taken seriously ill while in, you're in France, uh, you need to think about how that will be handled. And there are insurance policies you can get which will add uh, repatriation to an EHIC or GHIC cover. Uh, you shouldn't carry any uh, diesel, any marked diesel, I should say, in uh, cans. That's a definite no-no. And ideally, you should have diesel receipts to show that you've paid tax on them in the UK. Now, all this paperwork, uh, with the exception of passports, is rarely, if ever, asked for. Uh, but it is essential to carry it. I think in all the years we've been uh, going to France, we've only once been asked to produce some of those papers after passports. We suggest that you keep the originals because some of those documents are very important ones uh, in a sealed folder in your grab bag uh, and keep copies in what uh, we call a day book. That means that if somebody does come on board and wants to look at your paperwork, you can have it immediately to hand. Uh, and if they ask for the originals, well, okay, it takes a bit longer, but it means that the, uh, the important documents you wanna keep for many years for your boat are protected. Of course, all the things I've just talked through in terms of paperwork and processes assume that you have a British registered boat and British uh, crew. So other things you might have, well, the passage plan, obviously, which we've talked about, uh, and your logbook completed, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, you should also think about shore contacts. Uh, and maybe you would file your passage plan using the RYA Safe Tracks app. This is an app you can put on your phone. Um, you set up an account and then you say, I'm going to be leaving, let's say, Yarmouth uh, on Friday and I'm planning to arrive in Cherbourg that evening. If you don't then go into the app later on and say you have safely arrived, then it starts sending messages initially to you uh, and then ultimately to your shore contact to say that perhaps something is wrong and they should be checking. Think about crew briefing, briefing notes. It's very important that you keep your crew well informed as to what is going on because it gives them greater confidence and an understanding of what the crossing is actually going to be. And of course, those notes should include things like basic equipment instructions and location, procedures maybe for reefing or man overboard or mayday. Uh, it should cover what they should expect in the overall passage plan. You should have a PPF, the, the port of entry form. Uh, this is the form on the right, and we'll be talking about this in a bit more detail later on. Courtesy flags. So if you're arriving in France, you should fly a courtesy flag, which is the French flag from your starboard um, spreader. And maybe if you want to go another step, you could fly the regional uh, flags for France, but it's not necessary. Um, you should also be prepared to fly the Q flag. Now, Arriving in most countries, you do fly the Q flag until you have passed customs um, to be allowed into the country. Uh, in France, you don't do that. In France, their understanding is the Q flag means you have goods to declare. So don't fly it. So your passage plan, write it down. All the usual elements, all the things we've been talking about here. You should review it regularly against those considerations. You should also review it as the departure approaches because maybe you're seeing what the forecast is and you may need to adjust things. You should review it based on discussions you have with your crew. And you should review it regularly while crossing, especially if things are not what you expected. Maybe the weather uh, has been different. Maybe you've had some sort of equipment issue. Maybe somebody's been seasick. Consider all of these things um, because maybe you will say, well, I no longer go, want to go to that particular port. Somebody's being a bit seasick, so we're going to do a faster crossing and we're going to go somewhere slightly different. So what about passage making, that executing your plan uh, and enjoying the time? So let's go through. So the first thing is review your passage plan before you set off. Make sure nothing has changed uh, that alters that plan. You then need to check out of the UK. Now, we're going to talk about this in more detail later on, um, but it is now something that is very easy to do online. And you might want to make a note of an R a URL, which is spcr.homeoffice.gov.uk. Uh, and that's actually the app that you will see on the right hand side of this screen. 
um, actually on my phone. And it's an image from a few years ago, actually. So that's why there's only four submitted plans. Um, and brief your crew. Again, make sure they all understand what you're going to be doing. Remember to fill in your logbook. If you do have officials come on board, they may well want to look at your logbook to see where you have written down that you've come from uh, and maybe where you're going. So put in your boat status, so your speed, your heading, course over ground, whether you're sailing, whether you're using the engine, the usual things, the weather in terms of visibility and cloud cover and wind direction and strength. Uh, and there on the weather, you're really looking to see if there is some trend over the hours of your passage that is perhaps different from what your passage plan assumed. Uh, put in your position in that and long. Um, if I go back, well, a few years, I used to plot my position every hour on an actual physical chart. I tend not to do that now. As long as I've written it in the logbook, then if all the instruments pack up on me, I can very quickly put those Latin long positions from the logbook onto a paper chart. And also log any VHF use, particularly if it's official sort of business in terms of contacting coast guards or ships. So navigation. Well, obviously review what you're doing as you go against what your plan was. Look out for lobster pots. Lobster pots uh, in France are generally better marked than they are in the UK, uh, but with the stronger tides, they can also disappear under the water or very close to the water level. You're also still going to come across lobster pots even mid-channel, so be aware of that. Keep a lookout all the time. When you arrive in foreign waters, well, you may be flying the Q flag if you're going to the Channel Islands, and of course, fly the courtesy flag. Now, shipping is one thing that people are very worried about uh, when they're crossing the channel because they know that there are all these ships going up and down. And when you look at the sort of um, marine traffic diagram you can see on the screen now, it looks quite horrifying. But actually, they're much further apart uh, than they appear on a diagram like that. Uh, and the important thing is you've got to be making sure that you're going to miss them or that they're going to miss you. CPA, closest point of approach. Uh, I find it easiest to identify using AIS or radar. But as, as I say, sometimes we're not playing space invaders. It's a real world. So it is also an eyeball task. So you should also have your hand bearing compass available to you to really compare that information. And in particular, with a hand bearing compass, it's easier to work out if your instruments don't tell you whether a ship is going to be going ahead of you or astern of you. My personal view is that if necessary, do call up a ship to confirm your presence and action. And you will often hear ships calling up each other. Most ships turn early to avoid you. In fact, they will often turn so early you won't even notice it. They may do it 15 miles or more away. But there are a few perhaps who are not paying close attention and they don't. And that's where you need to be aware of what the collision regulations say and make your decision about what you should do. When you're actually arriving in port, be very aware of other ships coming in and out because they will often be moving quite fast. In particular ferries, you know, usually we're going into a port of entry, which is a ferry port. So there are going to be ferries going in and out and equally fishing vessels. And remember, don't just look ahead of you, look behind as well. And bear in mind, there are two traffic separation schemes in the channel. Um, there's the eastern one up towards um, Dover, uh, and there's the one north of the Casquettes. And be aware of the different collision regulations that apply and your own course that's required if you're going through those two TSSs. Now, if we take the typical sort of crossing from, let's say, the south coast around the Solent or Pool, uh, and we take it sort of the shortest point from there, which is the northern end of the Cotton Tan Peninsula, so in effect Cherbourg, um, you're going to be sailing for 12 or maybe 15 hours. Now, concentrating for that sort of period of time is quite tiring. Um, so I really do suggest you let the crew take a turn at steering, uh, particularly, as I mentioned earlier on, if there's a risk of seasickness, um, but have somebody else steering from time to time. That means you and others on the crew can relax for an hour or so 
Uh, and it means that when you come back on watch again, then you're fresh and you're ready to look out for things. The rule always, though, is if you're wondering about calling the skipper, you must call him or her. And you can see in this particular picture, uh, you know, you don't have to go below to relax. Just the fact of lying down on the uh, on the seats in the cockpit just means that you're a little bit off watch. You're relaxing for a short period. So safety and emergencies. Well, we know in the UK we have our Coast Guards like Dover Coast Guard and Solent Coast Guard. It's the same thing in France. Uh, there are three Coast Guard control areas that cover the Eastern Channel, um, the Central Channel, the Western Channel. CROSS is the center, re it's a regional center for operations, surveillance and salvage or sauvetage, safety. Um, but CROSS is actually pronounced CROW. Yeah, so on the VHF on Channel 16, if you're listening, you will quite often hear uh, Crow Jobourg, which is Cross Jobourg, uh, and they may be announcing a weather forecast on another channel or something like that. So if you have an emergency, these are the people to call. Channel Islands also has Jersey and Guernsey Coast Guard, and they all work together. Uh, and you can contact all of them on VHF Channel 16 or DSC. Uh, and of course, the other thing you may have on board is the RYA Safe Tracks app. Uh, which again provides that extra safety, particularly if you fail to arrive at the time you've predicted. So how would you signal that you need assistance? Well, you might use the DSC button on your VHF. You might use an EPIRB or a PLB if you have them. Uh, it's the usual Mayday and Pan Pan procedures. Uh, in English, uh, you can do them on Channel 16. Uh, if you want to contact the Coast Guard directly in France, the number is 196. Now you send out that, uh, let's say Mayday or Pan Pan, the Coast Guard that responds will depend on your location and they all work together. Uh, and sometimes when you're crossing the channel, uh, particularly at the Eastern end of the channel, you will hear the French and the British Coast Guards talking. Uh, and when you're sailing near the Channel Islands, you will sometimes hear the Jersey or Guernsey Coast Guard talking to the French Coast Guard. So you don't need to worry about who you're calling. You just put out that pan pan or whatever and somebody will respond. Now, bear in mind, in the UK, we are very, very lucky uh, with the RNLI because the, the services they provide and it's all free. In France, there is a similar organization called the SNSM. Um, they will come out and will equally rescue you or tow you in, um, but they will require payment. Uh, and they simply pay a uh, charge a certain amount per hour that they have been out for. They might even take you to a cash machine. Uh, we, we know somebody who ran out of fuel and asked to be towed in, uh, and he had to pay, I think, a couple of hundred euros, uh, and he was taken to a cash machine because he had no euros on him. Um, also, insurance. Uh, know what the procedures are in your paperwork, including things like salvage, so that when you get ashore, you can immediately do what your policy requires you to do. But the other thing I would say is we all help each other, don't we? You know, if we hear of another boat that is in trouble, uh, we, we will go and assist them. And I think over the years, we probably uh, certainly towed maybe three boats at various times for short distances to assist them. So we all help each other. Uh, we're, we're a mutually helpful um, hobby. So what about arriving? Well, uh, we've talked about the QFAG quite enough. Uh, courtesy flag should be up. French marinas. Well, it's an interesting point here. French marinas are mainly, if not exclusively, owned by the local town. Um, they are there as a public service to the residents of the town and to bring in tourists, uh, which means that they are a bit more helpful, I'm afraid to say, than some marinas on the south coast, particularly in the UK. Uh, they're a bit more informal. So what about getting a berth? Um, well, it is rare to actually book a berth in a marina in France. So first of all, you could call up on Channel 9, uh, not Channel 80 like in the UK. So you call up the marina on Channel 9 uh, and you would say your boat name, maybe the length and uh, how, how long you want to stay. And they may direct you to a berth. More likely, particularly in the summer, 
um, is you'll call up on Channel 9 and a Marina Dory will come out and welcome you um, and show you the way to a berth. Or it may be that you will arrive in the marina and there'll be a, a dory hanging around in the entrance. And all of these people will generally speak a bit of English for you. Most French marinas, certainly the ones of any reasonable size, have dedicated visitor pontoons. Uh, so in fact, the diagram here is of Cherbourg, uh, Port Chanteran, uh, and the red areas are for visitors. So if you arrived in the evening and there's nobody on duty in a dory, or maybe they're not answering on Channel 9, you can go to, port, uh, to NP or Q um, and find a berth. Uh, and you will find at the end of the pontoons, it will say you, to you, if you're over a certain length, you should go on this pontoon. And if you're another length, you should go on another pontoon. And you just go down there until you find a space and go into it. In the Channel Islands, uh, if you go to Bray on Alderney, then you simply pick up a boy. Uh, and in Bray, I think they allow two boats per boy. When you go to St. Peterport, you will almost certainly be met by a dory. But if not, there is a waiting pontoon. Uh, and St. Helier, you will draft on the waiting pontoon. So uh, that's arrival considerations. So what about the actual marinas itself? Well, first of all, tying up can be a little bit different from the UK. Quite often on their pontoons, they have hoops, not cleats. So you need to be ready to take a rope around a loop, a hoop, uh, and bring it back to your boat. Their pontoon fingers are often quite short. Uh, they're called catways and they can be a bit bouncy. So when your crewman jumps down onto it, warn him that it may go down and then come back up again. Uh, and you can see here a picture actually of a loop on the end of one of the fingers where you're tying the uh, line to the stern of your boat. When you're paying, you will probably have to fill in quite a few forms um, because you've got to prove, or not prove, you've got to set out the name of your boat, um, its length, your name, maybe your UK phone number, something like that. Uh, they will often also ask you where you come from and where you're going. That's not because they're noting information that perhaps you rather than not have, but it's actually one of the customs in France is that if you say where you're going, it means that if you disappear or somebody says, where is that boat? At least the last marina knows where you were going to. And if you're not certain, I, I found it quite, ha quite happy for them to uh, say, well, where are you going? And I say, we're going west. Payment credit card is the norm. Uh, you'll need codes usually for the facilities and for Wi-Fi. Fuel is usually self-service. So there'll usually be a fuel pontoon and you simply go and berth up to it, put your credit card in and serve your diesel or whatever. In terms of language, most staff, certainly in the marinas, are proficient in English. Uh, most of the... I was going to say guys, but guys and girls in the dories um, are students, particularly in the summer, and they will speak good English. So paperwork. Uh, ports of entry are the official route in, as we've said a number of times. Uh, some ports in France have had what is called either a derogation or a dispensation, uh, which allows entry, but with restrictions. So, for example, in 2023, there were five ports along the Brittany coast that are not designated as ports of entry, but for a limited period of time, you were allowed in there if you emailed that PPF form that we saw earlier in advance. Uh, now that information changes from time to time. Uh, there is a CA page that is available to the public, which sets out that information. Uh, and you'll see on the right hand side of the screen here, um, the Cruising Association's Captain's Mate app, which is available to members, goes into loads more detail uh, about how these ports operate. And that is based on the feedback from our CA members who are going in and out and what they have found most recently, plus what we've actually discussed with the local authorities there. Uh, right, so in terms of checking into the marina, well, uh, we talked about the paperwork already. Um, going into the Channel Islands, if you arrive at Guernsey, you will be given a form that you need to complete. Uh, which includes things like your passport information. 
Jersey, if you're a British citizen, um, they won't give you any paperwork. They're not really bothered. So the PPF forms, these were originally introduced by the French government um, with the view that they could be used in any port. But they then realized that was not going to work because passports had to be stamped to monitor the number of days that you were spending in the EU. Um, so as we've said, there are official ports of entry uh, and there are some with a special dispensation. Having this form on board for the port you're going to um, it will save you some time because it means that you can fill it in when you arrive. Uh, sorry, fill it in before you arrive. And then when you arrive, you can go straight in with the passports, hand it over. They will check it quickly and stamp your passports as opposed to you having to fill it in or them filling it in while you're standing around waiting. The process has become a bit variable as different ports have had derogations or dispensations, um, but it seems to have settled down now. And I think our understanding of what will come this summer uh, will be very similar to last year. But we come on to something else about next year in a moment. So UK, well, we used to use the old C1331 paper form for HMRC um, that we would fill in and post. Then as an interim solution after Brexit, they introduced a spreadsheet that you filled in. Uh, but now really the best thing to use is the Pleasure Craft report. It's all online. You set up an account for your boat. You name your regular crew. Um, you set out when you want to depart and where you're departing from and where you're going to arrive. You submit that plan in advance. Uh, and it's a very, very simple process. And it's easy to do even on a mobile phone. So 2025, we'll probably see the introduction of EES, although it may well come in in autumn this year, and ETS. Uh, these are part of um, an EU development that started, I think, back in 2012 or even before that. Uh, 2012 was when they produced a document which said these are the things we want to do. It was agreed by the EU in 2016, and, and the UK government was very firmly behind it. Um, so this will certainly affect our travels in 2025. But for the summer of 2024, we believe the arrangements will be the same as they were for last year. So French language. Uh, we've met people on rallies who have not traveled to France because their fear is that they don't speak French. You really don't need to worry about it. The marinas and the coast guards will use English. The restaurants will often speak English. And elsewhere, especially given that we're traveling in tourist areas, people will try to understand you. But having said all of that, it is polite, I believe, and you get a better response if you can learn and use a few phrases. Just saying bonjour uh, when you meet somebody can make a huge difference to the way that they are likely to respond to you. Now, in France, there are some wonderful open events. Uh, if you see something promoting a fête marine, which means a maritime festival, uh, that is really something that, well, certainly my wife and I and many of our friends enjoy. Uh, it's something that in a public place within a town, there will be food being served where you might buy moule frites uh, or ham and chips or something simple like that for seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 euros. There'll be drink being sold and there'll be music. And often the whole of the uh, event is free of charge. Outside the big towns, people will greet you. Just like when you walk through a marina in the UK, people will say good morning or good afternoon. In France, that extends ashore as well. Uh, even, even youths will greet you with bonjour or bonsoir, monsieur dame. Restaurants, um, a prefixé meal is a great value way to go. So you will often see outside a French restaurant, uh, the menu, which may say this menu for, let's say, 25 euros. And you will then see perhaps a choice of three starters, three mains, three desserts. You might find uh, another one that says the menu is 30 euros uh, for two courses. Um, and you can have a starter and a main or a main and a dessert. And maybe an extra five euros, you can have three courses. All of these sorts of prefixes can be great value and it simplifies your choices. Note that shops are often closed on a Sunday or Monday. So make sure you stock up on a Saturday. 
uh, and in, even in the big cities, uh, you'll find supermarkets will close on a Sunday afternoon. French markets are great fun. Um, they don't just sell food. They sell clothing. They sell furniture. They sell beds. They sell um, tools and hardware. Uh, they're a real experience to go to. So uh, we, we quite often decide where we're going to go based on what day the market is in a particular town. There's lots of history, lots of historic buildings, lots of museums to enjoy. And in many areas, they have a huge respect for the British, particularly along the D-Day landing coast. So hopefully you've now had your smooth passage. You've arrived there. Uh, you've checked yourself in to the marina. Uh, you've checked yourself into customs and you can now start enjoying all the different things that you might like, like the markets, the museums and so on and so on. But of course, you've got to come back. Uh, so in terms of planning, it's the same process. In terms of leaving France, make sure that you do check out. Make sure your passport is stamped for exit. Because otherwise, your passport is going to continue using the 90 and 180 days that we are allowed. And when you go back, they may well say to you, I'm sorry, you're not allowed in because you have overstayed a previous welcome. For the UK, uh, complete that pleasure craft report uh, for the journey back before you leave France. Uh, and Fly the Q flag into UK waters and maybe call you, uh, yacht line. Uh, what actually happens is when you submit the pleasure craft report for your return, uh, you'll get an e email back telling you what you need to do. Sometimes the email will say you are cleared for entry, just continue. Uh, other times it will actually say you must phone this number to confirm that you are allowed to arrive. OK, I'm overrunning slightly, so let me uh, dive through a bit more. Let's talk about some of the cruising areas. So first of all, the Cottontan Peninsula. Uh, all these chartlets that I'm showing you here are from uh, the Cruising Association's Captain's Mate app, uh, which sets out lots of port details. But it gives you some idea of the number of ports or maybe anchorages in each particular area. Um, from the Solent, Cherbourg, which is in the center, if I use my cursor here, yeah, if you can see that, so that's Cherbourg there, is an excellent arrival point because you can get in in any weather um, and it's a large entrance, very easy to get in and out of. It's a day sail away, uh, it's a full access port, it's easy to check in and check out, and there's lots to do in the city itself. From there, you could head east, and you could go to St. Var, which is here, or maybe down to Carenton here, or maybe along to, um, to Wistrom and Caen. Or you could go west. You could go around to Dialette and Carteret, or maybe to the Channel Islands. Or you could sail onwards down to North Brittany. So let's just talk about some of the key attractions. So Cherbourg. Cherbourg has a wonderful museum called City de la Mer, which is a huge aquarium, um, a tour of a nuclear submarine and a very interesting Titanic exhibition. There's a resistance museum up on the hill. Uh, you can hire e-bikes from the marina office and cycle along the coast. Lots and lots to do in Cherbourg. St. Var itself has a lovely marina. It's got a historical fort uh, and an island slightly offshore, which uh, there's a sort of bus that takes you to it uh, for the nature and the museum on that island. Carenton's a, a nice quiet river, uh, sorry, quiet marina up a long canal through a lock. Uh, maybe there you can hire a car. Hiring cars in France from supermarkets is amazingly easy and economical. Or you could cycle and, and perhaps visit some of the D-Day landing sites. Wistrom, you could take the canal up to Caen going through the famous Pegasus Bridge and the museum, both at the Pegasus Bridge, but also at Caen. At Caen, there is a war, or actually more of a peace museum, which is an amazing place to visit. Going west from Cherbourg, uh, you've got Carteret, which is a lovely, small, upmarket resort, very friendly yacht club. It's clifftop walks, there's a, fire, a lighthouse with an exhibition, and it has a superb sandy beach. You might go to St. Peterport on Guernsey, a tour of the island um, on bus for £1.50. It's got a lovely castle, a shipwreck museum, lots of other things to do there. There's also Victor Hugo's house, which is a fascinating visit. 
uh, is a German World War II signal station, which is fascinating. Uh, and again, there's two friendly yacht clubs in St. Peter Paul. In Bray, uh, you bought, take a boy in the harbour, you can go ashore and hire electric bikes to go around the island. Uh, you've got some interesting World War II monuments, a super local museum, and again, another friendly yacht club. Going to the other end of the channel, so the eastern end, uh, the Opal Coast, broadly speaking from Calais down to Facon, uh, the best ports of entry are going to be Calais and Dieppe. Uh, although Boulogne is designated as a port of entry, there is no office there for you to check in. So if you actually arrive at Boulogne to check in, they will tell you to get the train to Calais. Uh, and if we are a little bit further south, um, there's Le Havre, where you could check in easily. Um, a very nice city, despite being flattened and rebuilt during World War II, uh, and rebuilt mainly in concrete. Uh, visit the concrete cathedral. Um, some people love it and some people hate it. You've then got Enfleur, uh, Deauville and Dives, um, and you could sail along to Wistrom and Caen and maybe head back from there. So Dieppe, uh, interesting castle, nice market, Enfleur, lovely old town where you can moor actually in the middle of the town, providing there's room, providing you're not too big a boat and you're surrounded by restaurants. Uh, Saint Valery also, a uh, small marina, but a nice town with walks and clifftop views. Uh, you can get a bus, bus to Etretat for that marvellous chalky coastland, uh, clifftop views and superb gardens. Or you could go to Facon, uh, famed for its Benedictine distillery. And finally, an area of North Brittany, huge range of ports, all with different attractions. Um, so you might check in at St. Malo or Roscoff. I would not recommend checking in at Sambrieux because you've got to cross a drying bay through a lock and into quite a small marina. There are really too many places to go through them on a map like this on North Brittany, but it is a wonderful place to visit. Uh, I'll just pick out a few like St. Malo, um, great historical walled cities, got museums, entertainment, restaurants. Roscoff, a lovely small town, a tourist attraction uh, and a ferry port. Uh, Plumenac is unusual. Um, it's not really a marina. It's Dumbbell Boys, which, well, you look up in your pilot book what that means. But it has some terrific beaches, some lovely walks along the rocky coastline there. Uh, and it's very touristy, uh, which may be a good or a bad thing. St. Carr, a big marina, uh, full access, 24 hours, attracts lots of visitors. Very nice town, and it really does have a superb beach. Uh, Tregier, I, I picked this as my best port of France uh, a few years back. Uh, the marina is in the river. Uh, it's a historical town, lovely, lovely place to walk around. Uh, but on a Wednesday, they have a market which goes all the way from the marina uh, down at the river level, right up to up the slopes, up into the town. So a huge market. And then in the evening, they have music and food in the two squares there. So you can have a wonderful Wednesday uh, of, full of entertainment and interest. So channel crossing, great experience, easier than sailing in the Solent, I always tell people. But if you go through all these things that we've talked about, then you will have an easy passage. France, you know, all these things that we've talked about, it, it really is a wonderful place to visit on a boat. Uh, and the French love having boats coming in. They are very much like the British, a maritime nation. So some final tips. Do plan your passages and in particular your arrivals. In high season, so those four weeks between mid-July and mid-August, don't arrive at marinas too late or you may not get such a good berth. Choose the destinations and the times or the days you're going to arrive based on the history, the events, the tourist attractions, the markets, all those things that are taking you there. Do ask in the marinas and the tourist offices for advice on places to go. Uh, they, they will have very good information and lots of leaflets, often in English. Buses in France are frequent and they're very, very cheap. Many, many marinas will have bikes and often electric bikes that you can hire. Uh, and they also have things like navettes. So a good example of that is Chaburden, um, where the supermarket is a bit of a distance from the marina. 
Uh, so they have a navette. And basically, you go into the marina office and say, I'd like to go to the supermarket. You agree what time they will drive you there. Uh, and they will pick you up an hour later and take you back. Do keep an eye on the forecast, especially for return. You don't want to have to go across the channel in poor weather because you need to be back at work on Monday. So keep an eye out. And do keep your crew informed all the time with what your plans are and what they should be expecting. And the final advice is do travel in company if you can. If it's your first crossing, perhaps travel with another boat, maybe some friends or acquaintances in the marina that you're in. Uh, or maybe join a club rally. There are lots of clubs that do rallies across the channel, or maybe a race. Uh, and, you know, Cruising Association is a picture there of one of our rallies across to Cherbourg. Doing it in company gives you a greater sort of confidence about that journey. And there we are. Thank you, Paul. So, a few words about the CA. Um, <laughs> I am speaking on behalf of the CA. So, we're, you know, we're a worldwide community of about 6,500 members, uh, and we provide a lot of support to members. Things like events, lectures, forums, uh, the app. We do rallies, newsletters. There's a lot of things going on in terms of providing information to members and between members. Yeah. In, in particular, I'd also I highlight um, HLRs. We have honorary local representatives in many ports around the world, and those people are there to assist our members with whatever problems they might have or just recommendations of, re of restaurants. We have a crewing service. We have discounts. Uh, we have a clubhouse in London, which members can use and actually stay at. Uh, and we use that for seminars and, and other types of meetings. And we have our, re our regulatory and technical group uh, who provide a lot of information to members and are working closely with governments and authorities uh, and the EU on the information, the regulatory and technical information that affects us as cruising sailors. So they both provide feedback to those organizations like let's say HMRC, and they take information from them for our membership. And they will answer questions from particular members on particular topics. So there we are. Thank you very much. Oh, and I should just mention, this has all been covered by the CA's official disclaimer, uh, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Well, Bob, thank you very much for that. I must admit, that was an amazing amount of detail in a short amount of time. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. But uh, now we get, are you pleased to know that um, we've got quite a few questions? Well, you might not be pleased to know, <laughs> <laughs> depending on what the questions are, I suppose. Um, but yeah, we've got quite a few questions now. So um, let's sort of see if we can kick off. We'll start from top to bottom. Um, Simon Taylor has questioned in saying, when crossing the channel, is it best to just head on one bearing or zigzag across, I suppose, if you're depending on the wind direction. In, in well, that one. Yes, it, uh, yes, it does. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. It depends on the wind direction. Uh, you know, two things I would say. First is the one that I, the comment I made about not trying to do a straight line across the channel, because if you're doing that, ah, well done, you brought that up. Excellent. Um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're trying to do that straight line, you're going to be doing something like an extra five miles in distance. You've got to recognize the tide is going to whoosh you one way for, let's say, six hours and then whoosh you back the other way for six hours. Uh, I did a web seminar oh, a couple of weeks ago now, uh, and the title was Efficient Channel Crossing. And it was talking about the best way of taking advantage of the tides and the instruments and so on that you have. Um, so, no, you should not be trying to do a straight line across the channel. Thank you very much. Uh, John Jacobs has asked, is it imperative to carry a life raft? There's no legal requirement for you to carry a life raft. Uh, you know, in the UK, we, we are very lucky that we don't have all these legal requirements. Um, it's, it's a personal choice thing. I, I mean, I wouldn't cross the channel without a life raft, um, but I do know of people who do. Uh, I know of people who have, is it the ETAP, which is supposed to be unsinkable? So yeah, they, yeah. They, well, yeah, so they say, well, I don't need a life raft. Um, but my answer to that is, well, what if it catches fire? Um, I know other people who carry a dinghy on deck that's inflated. 
So, you know, it's all up to our own pers personal decisions about how safe we feel in different circumstances. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it's a personal choice matter. Uh, the, the important thing, as I mentioned, though, is that if you do have a life raft, it mustn't be out of date. Otherwise, it comes under health and safety regulations in France. And they might, if they, on the rare occasion they came on board and found that that was the case, they might decide to fine you for that. And, and don't forget, if you don't have a life raft yourself, you can hire them. I think when we started off doing channel crossings, we would uh, typically hire a life raft. I think it's a question of safety, isn't it? It's how, it's how, mm. how you feel safest, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Yes. I mean, I, I, always, I always sort of joke about when, when you do something like the round the island race, uh, if somebody falls overboard, I always say they're more in, more in danger of being run over than, than drowning. Uh, that's not the case when you're crossing the channel uh, because people will be a distance away to provide assistance mm. for you. Yeah, so you've got to bear that in mind. Absolutely, you're, yeah. You're, 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 once you're out of sight of land, it's a different kettle of fish, isn't it? Really? Yes, it is. Mm. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the next question is um, French tidal atlas. Apparently, they're they're quite good as well. Have you used those in the past? I haven't. No, I've always used um, the Admiralty ones. Um, but yes, I mean the, the French charts generally, and the French it's called Block B L O C. Um, books which are a bit like a pilot book sort of mixed with a chart they are they are very very good um, but perhaps you need to know a little bit of French mm. yeah but but you know tidal atlas I suppose it's you're not it's not that wordy it's a diagram yeah <laughs> it's the pictures there <laughs> yeah like but I mean, the, 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 the tidal axes that I have are for the Cherbourg Peninsula and around the Channel Islands, and they're the Admiralty ones. And that's all that I've particularly seen a need for. Um, when you get down to the Brittany coast, um, the almanacs generally have the tidal stream information that you need. Uh, and the eastern end of the channel, again, the, the almanacs generally have it in the level of detail I would expect. Brilliant. Um, what if you can't provide that proof from Henry Hope? Um, it's one of those long-term questions, mm, isn't it? <laughs> it, it is. Uh, there was a way. Well, first of all, I, I, I'm not the not the right person to answer the question. I believe boats before a certain date you don't need to worry about, but I'm not certain what that date is. Uh, and I believe there is a form you can get from the UK government if you can give them sufficient information, which will then be accepted across the EU. Um, I think it's something like a T2L or something like that. Uh, but the, ch the chances of them querying the VAT information on an old boat are so remote, so remote. I mean, just what, this is probably just a good time to mention is what we're going to try and do is with all the emails going out to everybody, we're going to try and provide links to all the documents and to the to the government app and all that sort of thing. So we'll try and provide links to all that um, mm. to everybody so you can sort of go and find all the information for yourself. So just yeah. just something to add in at that point. Um, next question from Dean Adams is there's a lot of confusion about the Q flag, which I think we covered in it. Um, there are still websites out there that are still saying you should fly the Q flag, but you you said not to. Is it, could you just clarify that for us? Yeah, I, France is in the use of the Q flag a little bit strange. I mean, generally, my understanding is every country in the world, when you arrive before you check in, you fly the Q flag, which mean which stands for quarantine which means that you have not yet checked into the country and you shouldn't take it down until you've done that. Um, and in some places you fly it and the officials come, will come out because you're flying it. We have been told by the, certainly the officials in Northern France, is that that is not the case, um, that you don't need to fly the Q flag. And indeed, it is seen as being that you have goods to declare. Now, We've, we've had cruising association members say, you know, I arrived in France and I flew my Q flag and I was in the marina for a week and nobody ever came and saw me because they're not bothered, to be honest. If it's a British boat coming in, um, you go and check in. Yeah. Now, perhaps I will temper that 
slightly with us. Well, can I have I got a couple of minutes to tell a story? Yeah, <laughs> we we um we arrived in Granville uh, like this is last summer, and we were chatting to the boat next to us. Uh, I'm not not sure how we got onto the topic about checking in, but he said uh, he said oh he said I've been boarded three times, and I said really why. And he said, well, he said, we checked. And I said, did you check in? He said, yes, of course we checked in. So I said, well, what happened? And he said, uh, we went into Cherbourg and we checked in and we sailed to St. Peterport and we then sailed on to, I think it was Pampol. Um, and the following morning in Pampol, we were boarded. And I said, well, presumably you hadn't checked in. And he said, I checked in in Cherbourg. And I said, but you left France to go to the Channel Islands. You needed to check in again. And he said, no, no, I checked in in Cherbourg. Um, so... The French are aware, you know, if you arrive somewhere and you haven't followed the processes, there is a risk that you're going to be boarded. Uh, but equally, we've met other people who have said, no, we sailed to France, we spent a couple of weeks there, we sailed back and we never checked in. But they're taking a chance. Uh, and, you know, who wants to do it? And he, I think he was stopped for three times because he got on some list of somebody who was not doing the right things. But the yeah, officials, yeah. officials are very friendly. <laughs> And helpful, but follow the rules. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of experience of France is that yeah, as long as you get on, as long as you get on with the officials and try it out, they're generally they're generally really nice people to deal with. So yeah, yeah. um, someone uh, uh, Graham has sent in a, a point. He's returning from Brest and he plans on going to Fastnet and then up the east coast of Ireland back to Scotland. Um, you do not fall in the shedding time restrictions in Ireland do you need to pop into UK water first to stop the EU clock or does it stop when I check out of France so it's I think yeah, they're going from France to Ireland mm -hmm. do they need to pop into the UK first to stop the UK clock before going across to Ireland I suppose um well first of all if he checks out of France then um the 90 day clock stops if he goes straight to Ireland then he should check in again, yeah, because he's left the EU and Schengen and he's then checking in to Ireland. Um, if he didn't, if he didn't stop at the UK, then, you know, he's free to go directly from France to Ireland. Yeah, it is a little bit complicated, though, because if, because Ireland is within the common travel area with the yeah. UK. So the paperwork that is necessary is is, is a bit easier. And I, I'm not the right person in the CA to know the details of of Ireland, I'm afraid to say. But, no. but when, you check, when you check out, you are stopping that 90-day clock. OK. Um, next question from Jason. Would I need more documents or paperwork if I have charter guests on for a day charter? Um... So he's running a commercial operation. Yeah. The simple answer to that is I don't know. I, 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 I'm not involved in commercial boats mm. going between Fair countries. Enough. So I think he would need to get advice on that. Okay. Um, next, the, the next one I know we've discussed before. Oh, wow. um, what if you have a dog? A dog. OK. <laughs> um, right. So getting your taking your dog to France on your boat is not that complicated, although you, uh, the complication is bringing the dog back because you cannot bring a dog into the UK from the EU except on a ferry. OK, so and even then you have to go through checks with vets and have a pet passport and all these sorts of things it's quite a complicated process uh again actually that there's a there's a whole section on the cruising association's website about taking dogs across international borders um so you know going one way is not that difficult but coming back again is quite a complication uh, and we know people within the ca who uh for that reason actually just sail from the UK to the Channel Islands and back, and they don't go to France because of the, the, the difficulty they would then have with their dog being on board. But there, but equally, there are other members. In fact, I think the CA's president has a dog, and he regularly goes to France and comes back. Yeah, because I think you've got to have a 
uh, something with a vet a few uh, a certain amount of days before you come back and all that sort of thing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 And it's okay. and, it, and it's got to be on a ferry. The dog. Oh yeah, and it's got to be on a ferry. Yeah, sorry. And it, <laughs> and it can't be on its own on a ferry. <laughs> That'd be dangerous. Um, Jason's asked: Is my receipt for red diesel still valid, or would I be charged VAT on arrival? Um, right. So because we are no longer part of the EU, um, they can't fine us for having red diesel because we bought it outside of the EU. But the reason we used to have the problem was that there was an EU regulation that said that marked, i.e. red diesel, uh, could only be used for commercial type operations. So that no longer applies. The problem is that if you do have red diesel, they may be suspicious and want to know where you bought it from. Because for all they know, you might have bought it in France from some farmer um, and stuck it in your diesel tank, which would be illegal. Um, so it is best to have the receipts that proved where you mm. bought your diesel. And certainly you must not have marked by red diesel in um, cans. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, a member of my crew requires a visa. Does the paperwork for him differ compared to a British citizen? Depends what nationality he is. Uh, the best way of checking that would be to go to the French consulate website, and there's a there's a form on there you fill in saying what passport you have, and it then tells you what the visa requirements are and whether there are any checking in requirements. So it depends where he comes from. I mean, there, there, are, there are some nationalities, I think, who have an ease and easier entry into France than ourselves, and there are the ones who have a very difficult access to France, or, or indeed the EU generally. Excellent. Um, and is the key flag required for return to the UK when using SPCR, the app, that is, I think? Yes, it, it depends what reply you get when you get the email confirming that you've submitted your passage plan. Uh, you may get an email which says um, that you need to phone when you get within territorial waters, in which case you should be flying the queue flag from when you cross the 12 mile limit until you've rung them and they've said take it down. Uh, but you may, as we did, I think last time we came across, we got an email saying, uh, unless anything changes in your passage plan, you are cleared for entry and you don't need to do anything, in which case you don't need to fly the queue flag. Cool. OK. And um, does each member of your crew need to present their passports or can the skipper do all of them? No, you must all go with your passports because they will compare the photograph with the people. Oh, we're whizzing through these ones now. <laughs> On arrival at a French port, how long do you have to report your arrival to the, the authorities? <laughs> um, I mean, in theory, you should do it immediately. But in practice, that's pretty well impossible. Um, you know, if we take somewhere like, uh, let's think of a couple of extremes. Um, well, Cherbourg, oh, that's a good, a good example, Cherbourg. So in the summer um, in Cherbourg, the the police are frontier come to the marina at i think it's nine o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the evening so if you arrive at eight o'clock at night you can't check in until 9 a.m the following morning um so you've you've, you know, you've stayed a night uh and you haven't yet checked in um if it's not the summer in Cherbourg, you've got to go to the office which is 15 20 minute walk away um, and you've arrived at eight o'clock at night. I don't think they're going to be worried if you don't do it until the following morning. You probably yeah. prefer it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, providing you are being reasonable, you're not waiting a couple of days, uh, they, they are taking a very reasonable approach to it. Uh, and so, and just to, to sort of add to that, when you leave, um, there was in the very early days of all of these new processes, uh, there was one particular issue of a, of a CA member who checked out of Roscoff and was told, you've checked out, you must leave within two hours. And they didn't want to leave within two hours because it would meant they were going to leave against the tide and in the dark. Um, but they did leave. Um, and we... Um, 
we filed, well, not filed a complaint. We said this is not correct. And we got back a response uh, to actually say, no, that particular officer didn't understand. Uh, and that is not something that will happen again. So they understand yeah. that if you're leaving early the following morning, if you're checking out the evening before, that's fine. And we've done rallies where we've had 20 boats check out on a, on this particular case, they checked out on a Thursday evening and they left at Friday lunchtime because that was when the tide was right. So there, they, there's a little bit of flexibility out there for us. Yes, and, and I mean they, they, the, the uh, police frontier or the Duan understand about small boats. Uh, they may not have done that initially when all this kit started off, uh, but they do now. Brilliant. This is a quite a technical one, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. EU rule change effective 2024 for VHF radio channel passivation. Is this required for existing VHF radios? I think this relates to, was it Belgium and the Netherlands, where they've redesignated some VHF channels to something else, um, which means you mustn't have those channels on your VHF. Um, I don't know the detail beyond that, I'm afraid to say. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was it quite technical. I was going. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there a central canal going from, say, Calais to the Med? Mm -hmm. sure. Yes, there are. There are a number of uh, canals that go through France, and quite a few CA members take their boats to the Med that way. Uh, you need to be aware of the draft limits. Uh, you know, if you've got a deep draft boat, you won't be able to do it. But there are different routes and different routes are better at different times of the year. Um, we have a group which is called the European Inland Waterways section who public, uh, publish a lot of information about doing exactly that. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 again, there's a lot of information out about that sort of thing. So mm. I think it's, yeah, it's, it, I think... But you've got to be prepared, I think, if you're on a sailing boat, mast down and yes, all that sort of side of things. Yeah. Um, yes. Are there any VTS radio protocols for the Dover Straits crossing or can you just keep a listening watch? Um, if you are, well, first of all, if you're going into, let's say, Dover, then there are requirements for you to monitor a particular channel. And in fact, you must report to Dover even if you're passing, I think, within a couple of miles of Dover port. Uh, so, yes, there are requirements and there are channels that you should listen to as you're crossing the channel. But if, for example, you were going, let's say, from Eastbourne across to Boulogne, which is a little bit further west, then there aren't those sorts of requirements. It, it's really um, the Dover and Calais areas where you need to be particularly attentive to the Dover channels and the uh, Calais channels. Excellent. Um, do Irish vessels need to show paperwork to harbour officials in France? I suppose that's an EU Schengen thing again, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. And it depends where they've arrived from. If they've, if they've sailed from Ireland to the UK and then to France, then they're going to need to check in when they get to France. Um, but if they've sailed directly from Ireland to France, then they don't. Um, in your experience, this is from Joanna Willis, in your experience, how much shipping and other boats do you encounter on a crossing? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to sort of quantify it. I, I would say in a typical crossing, you might come across or get, get within a few miles of maybe four or five boats going each way. Um, the complication tends to be they're a bit like London buses. They do they do appear to co to come together in groups just where you want to cross, just to make it a little bit more complicated for you. Um, but my experience is that you know they do plan to miss you very early on. Um, there, we had a very good presentation from a CA member a few years ago who did a study with um, commercial vessels skippers, asking them about how they deal with pleasure vessels. And there were various things that came out as a common theme, like they will aim to miss you by a mile. Uh, many of them will have a rule on the bridge that says, if you're not going to miss something else by a mile, you must call the skipper. Um, so things like that, that sort of give you an extra degree of confidence. I have, 
Yeah, we, we have had occasions where we've had to call up ships to say, you know, what are your intentions? And 99 times out of 100, they just haven't noticed you and they will do a, an alteration of course. Um, I know there are some people who say you shouldn't call ships, you should just follow the collision regulations um, because of the risk of confusion, uh, particularly confusion between the boats that you're calling. Um, but I think you know, we have AIS, which means that we know the names of the ships and we can do a DSC call to them, which means that sorts of risk is going away. But again, it's a very much a personal thing uh, as to what you should do. You know, you're, you're following the collision regulations. If you don't want to contact them, well, you're going to be the person that has to take the avoiding action. Uh, I think as well, um, when you are approaching even not just the shipping channels, but just ships that are sort of in a group, try and maintain a particular course and a particular speed so that it's easier for them to work out how to miss you. If you've got somebody who's not particularly good at steering and the boat's heading is changing dramatically, and of course, if it's a yacht and the direction is changing significantly, the speed is going to change dramatically, you're making it much more difficult for those commercial ships to miss you. Yeah, really good advice there, because yeah. yeah, it's it, those those channel separation zones. In, uh, uh, as you say, I think they can be quite crowded and they can be empty. <laughs> it just <laughs> depends which, which which side of the coin you flip that morning. Um, yeah. Is the cruising association only or mainly for sailing boats? That is a... um, it is for both. We do have a lot of uh, non-sailing boats, particularly on the inland waterways. Um, certainly on the rallies that we've organised, most tend to be sailing vessels. Uh, but no, it, it's a complete mixture. And and and, and, e and even if the rallies are mainly sailboats, there's still a there's a lot of good resources within the cruising associations and a lot of friendly advice which you can which you can get as well. Which you know things yeah. like this, things like advice about what to do, and you can always ask a cruising association member or get one of the local guys to or get one of the local representatives to sort of help yes. you out when you get those sort of things. So yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, our, our honorary local representatives are absolutely invaluable. And particularly the, the years since Brexit, the ones in France have done a real sterling job for us in, in working with the local authorities over there as to what the processes are and, mm. and lobbying for changes and communicating that back to us and us saying, well, why don't you do it this way? Um, so, you know, it, it's had a huge effect Um not just for CA members, you know, we've, I, I would claim we've made it easier for everybody. But it's certainly good to have someone over there who's looking after you anyway. Um, yes. Marcus has, has written in, it'll be my first time doing the crossing and I'm doing it with another vessel, skippered by someone who's done the crossing a few times. I'm being informed about how everything, so I'm trying to learn as much as possible. I tried to look up all this information for the session, however, I didn't find anywhere near as much as you have covered. This is more commentary, so... Apart from session like this, how would you recommend I find this information online? Question at the end there. Uh, join the CA, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, do join the... The, the simple um, answer. I mean, there are lots of discussion forums which you could use. I mean, there, there, are, there are perhaps YouTube videos that you might be able to watch. Um, magazines will often cover articles, have articles about crossing for the first time. Um Talk to other people. If your boat's in the marina, chat to other people in the marina with their boats and say, what's their experience of, of crossing? You know, everybody has to do it for a first time. Uh, and I would say, uh, well, the first time I crossed, I was crew. Um, so I was very much learning from the skipper. Um, when we first took our own boat over, um, I had, well, I was talking to other people in the club. In fact, our first crossing was part of a club rally. Um, so, you know, I was probably getting advice off other people within the rally. I think I did. I can't remember. It was a long time ago now. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's a common held misnomer, isn't it? It's the fact that, you know, boat, boaters are very approachable. If you do go into your, if you go down the pontoons or talk to a fellow boater there, you know, nine to, 99 times out of 100, they're more than happy to help you, mm. give you advice, you know, give you guidance and all that sort of side of thing. So yeah. it's it's an invaluable source of information. It's just in your local marina, in your local club or something like that. Mm. Yeah. We, we, all, we all have a common objective 
uh, and therefore we share the information that we have i think hmm. oh yeah definitely it's, it's a common goal isn't it so yeah. um peter baker has asked i'm thinking of leaving my boat in france for a couple or a few weeks returning to the uk before returning to france to sail home any advice on this, please? And he finishes with great presentation, by the way. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry. So he's taking his boat to France and he's coming Leaving back. Leaving it there, but coming back. There. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Uh, lots of people do that. You know, I, I would suggest in that case, you should warn the marina you want to leave it in well in advance uh, because they may want you to put the boat in a particular different place within the marina. So, for example, not on the visitor's pontoon. They may want you to take a residence berth for a period of time um other than that no 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 particular issues you know you've checked in your passport stamped when you leave um you know you go to the ferry and they will just recognize that you've had the passport stamped stamped you out and then when you come back across the opposite process not a problem at all nice and easy um alan price has said what about flares <laughs> um well flares are becoming less and less common let's put it that way uh, if you look at the french regulations for french sailors they still have a requirement for flares and the types and the numbers of flares that they carry are determined by uh, i think they call it the distance from safety or the distance from shore uh, in the uk we don't have those regulations um, my personal view now is that with the combination of things like dsc radio your VHF, just your ordinary channel 16, um, mobile phones if you're close to shore, uh, PLBs and EPIRBs, the need for flares has gone down quite dramatically. And uh, we, did a, we did a passage as part of an arc uh, a few years ago. And it was interesting during the actual arc rally um, that the arc themselves changed the regulations on the number of flares you will carry. So I would say, um, I think the general recommendation that I've seen is that you should carry a smoke um, flare yeah, the, for, for daylight use to identify your boat if there's a lifeboat or a helicopter coming to you. Um, and maybe you would have some hand flares, but the recommendations seem to be moving away from rocket flares. Because if you're sufficiently offshore that a rocket flare is going to be of use and they only last a few seconds, remember, the chances of it being seen are not that good. Whereas if you can send out a DSC call or you've got a PLB, then that is better. Mm. Yeah, but it, but it is. Yeah. I mean, and I would say, you know, look at uh, look at what the RYA website says about it uh, and look at what the CA's um, RATS team say about flares but but i would say flares are becoming less relied upon yeah technology has sort of moved on a bit hasn't it and it it, has. there are there are better ways of communicating i think it's probably yes. probably probably that isn't it yes um when i visited cherbourg earlier this year the police station to have your passport stamp was a 30 minute walk away is that this is that the case uh, well, I said it was 15 to 20. Probably depends how fast you walk. Uh, <laughs> but yes, I mean, in Cherbourg, that, it is there. It is that distance away. Um, but in the summer months, they come to the marina uh, for a set period of time um, in the morning, in the evening. Uh, we don't know what those times are going to be yet for this summer, but I'm pretty confident that they will do that again this year. Uh, and, and I think on one particular occasion, my wife and I, we did walk to the office because we I can't remember why um I can't remember why we did it there was some particular other appointment we had or something when we said well we're not going to get to the marina office at the right time so we'll just walk there uh, and i think we walked there and then walked onto the supermarket and then back um do you know if mobile phone service is available for the whole stretch of the crossing to northern Brittany? <laughs> no no, I think you lose it, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> no, you do, you do. Uh, no, I, you you certainly wouldn't want to rely on it. I mean, I no. I did I did on one occasion receive a text message halfway across the channel, which has absolutely astonished me. Uh, but no, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna lose you're gonna lose the signal at some stage. Um, Alison Scattergood, do you have to have a formal qualification, especially if you have a lifetime of experience? Does the French <laughs> require that or? Okay, uh, 
there is a thing called i think it's the istanbul istanbul agreement or protocol or something which basically says that if you are if you are going into a foreign port they can only test you against the rules of the country that your boat is registered and your passport is for so um there is no requirement in the uk for qualifications so the french in theory according to that cannot require you to have it having said that um there are countries where they have passed laws which sort of counteract that and unless you're an international lawyer do you want to get into arguments about the istanbul protocol versus the local national laws um, my recommendation would be that you're better off with that certificate um, for any instance yeah but it's according to the Istanbul protocol, I don't think it, it's not a requirement. Excellent. And do charges apply for fresh water in fresh in French ports? Uh, not that I've ever come across. No. No, I'm not. I don't know about the Mediterranean coast. I, I have sailed the French Mediterranean coast and I can't remember paying for water. But I haven't gone to as many ports there, so I'm, and I haven't been there recently, so I couldn't be certain. But not the Channel Coast. Uh, and Simon Benton asks, what about the tides around Guernsey? How do I enter? <laughs> Carefully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, think uh, I mean, well, the, tides... the tides around there are uh, <laughs> quite yes. tricky. Yes, the tides around Guernsey are phenomenal. Um, you do need to make sure that when you go through, particularly the Little Russell, which is the channel between Guernsey and Herm, um, that you're going with the tide. Because if you're going against the tide, you won't go anywhere. You will probably go backwards. So, yes, you need to plan very carefully in terms of your passages for that. And, and, also, and also just bear in mind that uh, within that channel, if you're going with the tide, um, you may have the wind against you. And then you get wind over tide, so you can get some big swells there. No, that's, that's really important around there. Yeah, the, the, the water's dirt around there could be quite interesting. Yes. Um, have you or anyone you know have experience of staying in France longer than 90 days in 180 due to having an EU spouse? Quite specific, but... Yes, it's a common question. If you have an EU spouse and you're travelling with that EU spouse then you are not restricted to the 90 and 180 days. Um, and equally, if you have dependents, and I can't remember the exact definition of dependents, but if you have children, young children, um, then the same applies to them. So it, it is, in effect, a family thing. Uh, and we have CA members that are in that position. And in fact, we I was on a webinar earlier this week where we were quoting exactly the same thing. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. and perhaps just on that topic, I should also yeah. mention, if you don't have an EU spouse, there are visas that you can get for France. Um, and the CA have done a lot of work um, on how to get those visas when you don't have an address in France. So when you're taking your boat to France and you want to stay there for a longer period than three months. So that is also a possibility. You, you did, as I think you mentioned, it, you did, the, the Cruising Association did a webinar on that. Was it earlier this week or late last yes, week? Yes, it was on Monday night. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, I, remember seeing, I remember seeing the adverts for that. Yeah. Uh, I think we've answered that one. Uh, going directly to Brest, one likely has to anchor for some time before the tide is right for the rod to Brest. Is that a problem with checking in? In theory, when you anchor, then you are you have in effect arrived in that country so you should be looking to check in but again i would say that in that situation the french would understand what you're doing because you if they came along you would just say i'm heading into Brest to check in and they i think they would accept that quite happily 
Yeah, I, th I think I think for you to check to actually physically check in when you're offshore when you're still off the coast, I think probably unless they, unless they're going to come out and help you do no, it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I, 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 what what has sometimes caused um, questions is somebody who says, "Well, I'm going to go. We'll go back to the story we had early on. I'm going to go from Cherbourg to North Brittany, and in between, I'm going to anchor off Guernsey." Well, in theory. Um, you are no longer on a, I can't remember the terminology, but you're no longer on a continual passage because you've anchored in another country. And therefore, you need to check in when you get to North Brittany. Brilliant. Um, someone's, uh, so Stephen Robbins has, has a question in. For those of us up north, can you take the dog from France to Ireland, then ferry back from there? Um... I don't know that's, the answer. That, 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 yeah, that's quite a technical <laughs> one. Uh, where is the police frontier office in Wiestraham? Um, It's in the ferry port. Uh, I could probably look up on Captain's Mate precisely where it is, but it, but I know it's within the ferry port. Uh, and there are um, there are places where sometimes, for example, you have to go to the booths where the cars are checking in uh, and sort of knock on the window and say, would you stamp my passport, please? Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why it can be quite useful to have the form with you already, because you can then just give it to them rather than them give you a form in the pouring rain, which you have to fill in on the bonnet of some car that's waiting for the next ferry. It's always good, isn't it? <laughs> um, do you need, uh, Henry Hope asks, do you need a VHF certificate or pass certificate? Or, uh, is, if so, what courses are there? Uh, you should have a VHF uh, excuse me for a second. <laughs> you should have a VHF certificate for or license for the boat for the VHF, and somebody on board um, should have a VHF license for use of the VHF. That is a legal requirement, and that's a legal requirement in the UK. Yes, yeah. Um, if it's not peak season, can you request the police to come to the marina at Cherbourg? <laughs> you can try um, i think <laughs> i would doubt it uh yeah. i mean you might you you might pop into the marina office and say is there any chance but i think they'd probably say it's only a 20 minute walk um uh, and uh, we're down to we're down to the last question now um yeah. what do you invite eu spouse does ireland count i would have thought so yes absolutely if it's, if it's southern ireland it's, it's eu yeah yeah um, and then as someone said, uh, <laughs> we're getting quite a few points, Kerry Cross saying thank you for the, thank you for the great, great session. Uh, and well done to you for answering so many questions <laughs> <laughs> across quite a wide variety of subjects, I have to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's interesting, actually, because we did have a brief discussion the other day, didn't we, about what questions were most likely. I don't think we've had any of those. <laughs> no. In fact, in fact, I died. We, uh, I, I, we, we didn't have to, we did we've we had a whole lot of really good questions that have come in and it, it's it's been a really informative session and um i'd like to thank you bob for all your time this evening and for really giving a lot of really good information out there to a lot of people who can probably feel a lot more confident about going across but you know there are so many ways to go across there's so many you know cruising in company is so good you can uh, you can you can sort of relax amongst friends and all turn up at the same time and have a bit of a bit of a party. And I know the Cruising Association does a great job in informing all its members on all that sort of thing as well. Um, so if anyone wants contact details with Cruising Association or to take advantage of that discount code, then contact numbers, contact details are, are on the screen now. Um, but it just leaves me to say uh, thank you very much, Bob. What an amazing session, and it's been it's 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 been a revelation. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody.